Hi, my name is Patrick Boyle. Welcome back to my YouTube channel where we're going to learn all about derivatives and quantitative finance. If this is the first video you're watching, make sure that you click the subscribe button to see more content like this. This video is the last one in a series on the topic of risk management. I've put them all together in a playlist. I've actually done two playlists, one that's risk management in general and the other one that is VAR, so sort of a subset that just relates to VAR because a lot of people are interested in that as a standalone topic. And so the link to those playlists is above. By the end of this video, you'll understand some of the difficulties involved in risk managing a portfolio that contains derivatives, or even just a portfolio that's actively traded. And you may be quite surprised by some of the things you learn. Okay, so let's get straight into it. Many of the ideas we've talked about up until now, things like VAR for example, are based around the idea of managing the risk in a static portfolio. And by a static portfolio, I mean a portfolio whose constituents do not change. In the real world, many investors are much more active than that. But any activity or even planned activity, so things like stop orders that are in the book, can dramatically change the risk of a portfolio. The first thing we'll need to talk about, unfortunately, is distributions. Now, most of the people watching this video are, I imagine, reasonably financially sophisticated. In fact, as a bit of an aside, I'd love if you could tell me a bit about yourselves in the comments section below, as it would be really useful to me to know what kind of people and what kind of backgrounds my audience have. Uh, so tell me a bit about yourselves below. But for now, I'm just going to assume that you guys are already aware that stock markets and most investment products are not log normally distributed. But let's talk about how active trading affects the distribution that an investor actually will have in their portfolio. Portfolio. Many investors or investment educators like to encourage people to use stop loss orders in order to risk manage their portfolios. If you don't know what a stop loss order is, click on the link above to watch my video on order types. The argument given is usually that if you put a stop loss order in that's, we'll say, 5 or 10 percent away from where the market is right now, that you'll end up capping how much you can lose but still have unlimited upside. Essentially, people argue that you're chopping off the left tail of the distribution. Some will tell you that it's irresponsible and foolish to trade without stop orders. At first, this may sound like it makes sense, and a lot of investors imagine that a portfolio with a stop loss order in the books will have a distribution like the one that you can see on the screen right now. Obviously, that would be great if that was the case. More sophisticated investors understand that an order that's close to the market is actually more likely to be traded, and that's just because of the random movements in the market. If it's moving up and down just on random bits of news or on, you know, it's had a few good days, it has a few bad days, that could actually trigger one of your stop orders and knock you out. So when people understand that, they might then picture the distribution as looking like what you see on the screen right now, which shows the most likely event as being stopped out but nonetheless you truncate or cut off the left part of the distribution and keep all of the upside. But let's think a little bit more about this. Let's say that you put a stop loss in that's 5% below where the market is right now. It won't necessarily work every time the market falls because sometimes a stock might gap down, right? And so even though your stop loss was 5% below the market, if the bad news was announced overnight, for example, the stock might open down 20% and so you lose way more than the 5% that you thought you had limited your losses to. Examples of that would be things like September 11th where the stock market didn't open and then it opened a few days later down quite a lot. Another more important issue is that you will be losing a lot of your winners. So let's think about this. The idea that you're just cutting off the losses is untrue because a lot of your biggest winners will say the ones that went up two, three, four hundred percent maybe they first went down 5, 10 or 15 percent and then went up a lot, right? And so the problem is that it's not just saving you from losses, but it might be preventing some of your big winners from happening too. So actually, when you put a stop loss in the books, the problem is that it's just going to entirely change your distribution of returns and not just change that one tail of it that you're sort of 
probably hoping it will do. So what you see up on the screen right now is the actual distribution that you get from having a stop loss order in the books. And as you can see, by far the most likely event is that you're going to get stopped out. You are still getting some left tail risk, way less than before obviously, but you're still getting some. And you've equally lost an awful lot of your winners, as you can see there. And you have a distribution that, let's be really honest here, it's very, very far from a log normal distribution. So a lot of the other risk management ideas that are then going to be overlaid on this portfolio will be entirely inappropriate for it because they assume a log normally distributed uh, return series. Okay, so now that we understand how a simple stop order can impact the distribution of returns in your portfolio, you can probably see how any real trading activity in a portfolio is going to give you a portfolio that is far from being log normally distributed. So that means almost anything. If you're taking some wins off the table when the market moves up a little bit, or if you're adding on dips, or just anything that you might do like that is going to really change the distribution of returns in your portfolio. I'm sure that once you understand that, you can also imagine that a portfolio containing derivatives is also going to be far from being normally distributed. And thus that a lot of the basic ideas of simple risk management are wholly inappropriate for portfolios that are actively traded or portfolios that contain derivatives. Many portfolios do contain derivatives, such as futures, options, and swaps. In the case of a derivative on an equity, we know how to find the VAR of the equity over a one-day horizon at the 99% confidence level. We just need to find the volatility of its return and multiply its square root by the product of today's stock price and the confidence factor. But how can we find the VAR of a derivative on this stock? One approach is to link the derivative to the underlying stock and use the standard VAR method. To do this, we use a pricing method, such as the Black-Scholes model, to calculate delta, which gives us a way to translate the derivative portfolio into the stock portfolio. Delta tells us how the derivative's price changes when the stock price changes a small amount. So using our estimate of the stock's volatility, we could calculate VAR as we did before by multiplying delta times the square root of the stock's volatility times the confidence factor. An obvious drawback to this method is that it will only work when stock price changes are small. For larger changes, delta itself can change dramatically, leading to inaccurate VAR estimates. Thus, we need to account for how delta changes, which is known as gamma, and that of course complicates the overall analysis. To deal with this complication, risk managers often use Monte Carlo analysis. If you don't know what this is, I've linked to my video on that topic. Using the volatility and covariance estimates for the derivatives underlying assets, as well as a pricing tool, risk managers can then look at the largest loss the derivative will sustain for 99% of the likely outcomes. Let's suppose this loss is $100. Then the VAR of the derivative over a one-day horizon at the 99% confidence level is $100. This Monte Carlo approach can be applied to other portfolios with short volatility payoffs, such as merger arbitrage and event-driven strategies. As I mentioned early on in this risk management series, there are whole books that have been written on topics that I'm covering in a few sentences here. But hopefully this video has helped you think a bit about how modern quantitative risk management works and about the problems faced by risk managers. Hopefully it's opened a few eyes as to how much small changes in how a portfolio is managed can affect the distribution of returns and the risks faced by investors. Often things that seem like simple solutions like stop loss orders require greater thought than you might at first realize. It's time now for you to hit the like and subscribe buttons. All of this content comes from my book which is called Trading and Pricing Financial Derivatives and that is linked to below. Have a great day and tune in next week for another video on derivatives and quantitative finance. Bye.